Hello and welcome to week five in Introduction to Sociology as we continue our exploration of the different aspects of sociology here. We start going into um, some area. This particular week we are looking at the fundamental data that we have having to do with that primary objective of sociology which is to explain inequality. So we're going to be looking at inequality in all of its ways inequality at, from the point of our country, the United States, and then looking at things from a global perspective. If we go into Brightspace, we can see that the things that are due this week here in week five, we're going to be doing social stratification. That's a, a way of describing the hierarchy within the United States. And there's a single discussion associated with that. And then chapter 10, global, inequ global inequality, where there is a discussion and a quiz. So inequality is, it's one of those, well, let's just say it is both a bane, a, a, it's our Achilles heel in the United States and, and the world, you know, in terms of fairness and whatnot. And yet there are many aspects of our society that depend on inequality. So it kind of depends how it comes about and what, it, what it's in relation to. I think it's probably many of us believe that there are certain things that we should all be equal about. We should have equal rights and we should have equal access to health care. I'll get into that when I talk about health care. Um, but equal access to the roads, I mean, freedoms and, you know, pursuit of happiness and all those things. But we also really enjoy merit, people who strive and work hard to make themselves unequal to others. As, as I'm doing this video in a few short hours, the Super Bowl is going to be starting. And here, us in New England, we are... Uh, seeing our beloved Tom Brady, who has transferred himself from the New England Patriots down to the Buccaneers, and we're going to be seeing him go up against the rising star from Kansas City. And, but, it, but we want them to be unequal. This is the competition. It's the, it's the time for them to come together to challenge and to try and defeat the other. Someone's gonna be in second place tonight and there's gonna be one team in first place. And we like that inequality. So we have to see this in the various lenses that we can. When we look at inequality, there's the idea of fairness and then there's the idea of like achieved inequality because somebody uh, worked hard and, and, um, and got there by merit. So let's just dive in. I'm going to go through this rather quickly. I say that every time and then I end up with like an hour long video, but I'll, I'll say it every time. And then one of these days it'll actually come true. So to start off the social stratification uh, chapter, I have a really long attention getter and then a really short chapter. It's kind of a, maybe some of that stuff should go into the, um, into the actual uh, content here, but looking at that idea of, inequality. Now, first off, you often hear a lot of rhetoric that in higher ed there's a boosting up of Marxian principles uh, related to the solution to inequality. And to its credit, Marxism, which of course was the economic philosophy developed by Karl Marx, who was a silver spoon fed, extremely rich individual who never had to work a day in his life, as far as I'm aware, you know, developed this idea of the main problem in our society. Let's go way back to the beginning of the class when we were talking about Mr. Shoemaker and his factory. The problem is that Mr. Shoemaker has too much power over all of the people working in his factory. So you had this bourgeoisie in conflict with the proletariat. These are, you know, words from that philosophy. And maybe if we cut that down, we would, the masses would rise and there'd be more equity instead of this continued battle between those who own the means of production and those who have to work those machines. 
And that particular battle has been playing itself out across various economies. And certainly today, we still consider that disparity between those who own the means of production, those the owners, the developers, the bosses, and all that stuff that have a certain power over those below them, even though their positions are dependent on the individuals below, them, the people that are doing all the work. Nobody gets super rich by doing all the work. They get super rich by owning the means of production and, uh, and hiring other people to do the work. And the fundamental conflict that exists there that Marx tries to address is that power differential because there's always a desire from the, from the bourgeoisie or the owners of the means of production to minimize the biggest expense, which is payroll. And the people who are at the bottom want to maximize their income. So they want to spend as little as possible and the individuals at the bottom want to get paid as much as possible. And herein lies one of the fundamental aspects of our modern economy of that discrepancy. Now, I'm not a, um, I believe in some Marxist principles, I'd imagine, but you know, in terms of equity, and there are some, there are certain industries that work very well that are, that can be very publicly owned. And we have tons of them, like public roads and public transportation and these collective ways in which we go about doing certain kinds of business. But yet we still have a value system about the individual who, who works hard and gets ahead. When we, when we look at inequality and we look at it from this kind of perspective, we want to kind of navigate all the ways in which people become unequal and value them in terms, you know, is this a good way to become unequal, bad way? We need people to be really good at things because it inspires us. We need people, we need motivation to be able to move up and try harder. That will not always work for everybody, but those are, those are mechanisms and values within our country that have to get intermixed with the notion of, well, what's fair? What should everybody have? What's fair? What, what is equity? What is equalness? Addressing all of those um, scenarios. So, in, so what I do in the introduction place is I look at some of the, so, some of, some examples of inequality here and so we have different ways in which people get ahead. They, become, they, they make themselves unequal from others. And one is fortune. They were lucky. They were born into the right family. They um, were hunting muskrat and shot into the ground and an oil well popped up. They won the lottery. They uh, just happened to be in the right place at the right time. They found a, you know, box full of unclaimed diamonds in the park, and that was it, just fortune. Now I'm gonna throw into that fortune in terms of their own body, where they, where they were born, and, and those kinds of things that come along, that um, an individual who's born with an incredibly well put together body will ha can take advantage of that, whether they're very healthy, or they're very strong, or very beautiful, depending on the, um, cultural norms of that, those things are by chance. We got them, some people didn't, and then that, that people can use that to their advantage to make them unequal from others. The other one, of course, is the one we very much value, which is merit. The self-made person, the individual who worked hard, had a good idea, put all the sweat equity into it, and was successful because of that. This can apply to a business, relationships, athletics, you know, the individuals who worked hard to make it happen and therefore they got it. And we, we sort of like to see them as unequal. We have, a, we have a sense that they earned it and they got ahead because, because of that. And then there's systemic. And systemic is the one that bites us a little bit. Now, systemic is when there's a system in place, let's say a merit system, and there are artificial barriers within that merit system that exclude people. And these are the places that we look for, let's say, systemic racism or systemic gender issues or sy systemic gender preference, um, gender preference or 
not gender preference, but uh, sexual orientation. No, that's sorry about the terms there. But the these that there can be artificial barriers where those characteristics of you, your race, your sex, your gender, your sexual orientation, that have nothing to do with the ladder you're climbing up, actually restrict you from climbing up that ladder. Now this is. In our country, it's pretty rare that you're going to come across, you know, no gay people need apply. We're not going to come across that as a as a real kind of like, like we, we can call it maybe the the steel ceiling, you know, no, because that's discrimination. That doesn't mean that systemic aspects of uh, that organization can't still exist. They might be in the in the processes and procedures that you go through for recruiting people. There, there was one instance where there was a college that was, um, it was in an area that had a certain ratio of black and brown people and white people. And the attendance at that college, which is a public university, was not in the same proportion as that. And it's not that that's, you know, the, the kind of, you know, uh, seeking and, you know, exact representation of the local population isn't necessarily the only goal there, but it was sort of like, I wonder why that is. And then we find out that the school has no policies of discrimination, but yet they advertised only in predominantly white schools. It, that was just the list of schools they advertised in. So inadvertently, or maybe purposefully, I don't know how we're going to come to a conclusion as to you know, how these systemic things come about, but the advertisings for the school went out to these predominantly white schools, so most of the applicants were white, and therefore you had this discrepancy. But it was systemic, meaning that it was something about the processes that were going on that led to that inequality in terms of the distribution of race across the student body of that particular university. So we look at fortune, lucky people, merit, they worked hard, and systemic, which most of us probably want to get rid of that. Most of us probably don't want to have that systemic stuff. Fortune is, you know, it's what it is, and we might feel jealous that our friend won the lottery and we didn't, and they're not giving us any of it. But, you know, that's, that's the way fortune works. And then there's merit, of course, which we highly value. And uh, we have, um, you know, a really good feeling about when people, even when it's not us, maybe a good sportsmanship is really the idea that I appreciate the merit my competitor put in to beat me. And so that, you know, sportsmanship comes from that value system that merit is kind of cool. Now, as we look at each one of these, when we look at fortune, we're looking at healthy body, extra effective neuron connections, you know, good um, body coordination, good body coordination, uh, wealthy family background, lottery winnings, natural attractiveness and beauty, inheritance, born in the right century, the right place, the right nation. And that's just fortune. That's how it happens. And we get inequality from that. Now, then we have merit. This is, of course, people who work hard. And here we have, um, right in the right-hand side here, inequality based on merit. And I bring up the example, one of my favorite athletes of all time, Simone Biles, who is, is incredible. She's probably one of the greatest, uh, if not the greatest gymnast that's ever lived. She also seems to be a very interesting and intelligent and very friendly and personable individual, a driven person. Who, when we, however, when we look at this issue of fortune and effort in Simone, we see this sort of combination because, in fact, let's look at the merit stuff. I have some stuff on here. She had 7,000 7, hours of personal training. To become, she worked her butt off. You know she did. She she practiced and practiced and practiced. Did all this stuff. She had um, she had over ten thousand hours. 
She started very young. At, at, she had a professional coach at age eight because of the inborn talent she had. She's only five. She's only four foot eight, strong as an ox, and, and able to move her body in ways. Her body coordination is incredible. Now we have to place this in context. Now. Simone was also born into the Biles family, which is a fairly well-to-do family. They have an estate. They were able to homeschool little Simone so she could concentrate on her athletic career. And they built her a gym at home. And then they eventually built her, you know, the Simone Biles Athletic Center. And they really, they had a lot of cash flow to help her do this and really make this thing happened for for their daughter. Now this combination of fortune, luck that she was born in that family, and she had the support of the family and the support of her friends and the support of her parents to make these things happen, and her merit, her hard work practicing more than most people probably, uh, is what led to her extreme success. You know, in this world of elite athletes. She is uh, certainly a good person who portrays those both, thing, the, both of those things. Now, I grew up in northern Maine, and I'm a fairly um, vertically challenged individual at about five foot four and a half, depending on the gravity. The, um, and when I was young, I was nimble. I could, I'm still pretty nimble, I think, for 55, but the, I'm nimble and I can move around climbed on trees, did all that thing, backflips and, you know, did all that stuff. And I used to watch, I've always been obsessed with the Olympics and I used to watch gymnastics and I always thought, you know, I would probably be pretty good at that. I have, I'm really, really small, really, really, but really strong, really good coordination. But there was no gymnastics program in Northern Maine. None, none. At all, there was. I would have. I don't know if I was interested in that. I would have had to travel very far. I grew up with in a family that very, very modest income, and that opportunity wasn't there. Now I'm not sure if I would have had the wherewithal that Simone had to put as much as she did into it. I suspect I might not have, but the opportunity wasn't even there. And had Simone been born in Saint Agatha, the town that I grew up in, she too would have never probably developed into the athlete that she's there because the opportunity was never there. I'll tell another story. My brother, Jim, who grew up in the same town I did, obviously, we were originally from Montreal, which is, of course, hockey world kind of thing. My brother had an extreme talent in hockey. Uh, he dominated whatever team he was on in northern Maine. And I mean dominated like the coach would ask the other coach to take him out halfway through the game because, you know, scored it well. He could skate faster than everybody. I imagine that had we stayed in Canada, grew up in Montreal, that the opportunity for my brother to do much more in the world of hockey may have been very present. And considering that even without training, without coaching and whatnot, he could play as well as he did. He had that natural athletic ability. Had he grown up in an area that had a lot more opportunity, he might have done a lot more with that particular aspect of his life. He's a nurse practitioner now, so he's doing great, loves doing that, doesn't miss the, 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 the lack of a professional hockey career. But just something curious to think about how fortune, wherever you're lived, and whatever your family can afford to do and whatever circumstances you're living that allow you to do these things and then merit as well because Simone didn't get there because she was wealthy. She got there because she worked hard and continues to be that inspiration for young gymnasts around the world. Now system, systemic inequality, I go into that. We look at sex inequality. We look at um, the different kinds of ladders that are there, fraternal organizations, all male organizations, the old boys club, you know, women's experience barriers to law and business school success, all of these things. <clears throat> we look at the um, disparities um, that come from the Brookings Institute and all of these things that are, that when we see these gross inequalities and we think, and we can't really pinpoint why, it's like that. Like there's no really logical reason. It's probably because of a systemic reason. If we look at the Congress right now, primarily white males, why aren't there a proportionate 
number of females there. It's not that males are any better at governing than females are. We, I think that that's pretty clear. And so why is it that there's that disparity? And we would probably find that there are systemic reasons dating back to early life experiences and whatnot with those individuals. I mean, even in our socialization process, the, if you kind of look, uh, and, that, and, then I'm, and I'm not putting all the blame on that particular process, but certainly if you think about how children play, there's often a fundamental difference between the way young boys play and the way girls play that may have consequences for later development. So as a young boy, you compete with one another in terms of who can be faster, who can, usually in physical activities, but also in classroom and whatnot. There's a, there's a competitiveness among friends and leaders naturally emerge and the others look up to that individual. Even, you know, as a, being fair, you know, you, you beat me at basketball because you're a better player, so you become the captain of the team. Now, it's often seen that in, in girls, young girls, there's also that sort of competitive behavior, but it's different. What it, what it does, it's a competitiveness for sameness and reducing the amount of conflict among, among a group. So in young girl groups, what you see is if somebody starts to, and it goes both ways, they start to go above or below, the group tries to bring them together. And that can have an overall effect of don't exceed yourself because that will, you know, that is a, a violation of our a, a tacit agreement that we're going to remain the same. That we're, going to remain, we're going to remain friends and we're going to be, work out any inequalities between us. An extremely valuable skill both ways, both skills, but they get developed separately like that. So does that have a, you know, when, when there's, there is leadership that develops among girls, but it's different than it develops among boys. And does that eventually lead to differences in our political system? It might, it might. I will give you one study, for example, before I move on to our material here. And that is I had a colleague at the University of Maine at Augusta who part of her dissertation she did a study on wage differentials between women who worked at the University of Maine and men who worked at the University of Maine and saw that there was an incredible disparity of taking into account their degrees and experience and how long they're on the job and all that stuff. She found sometimes up to a $30,000 a year discrepancy between equally qualified men and women with the men being on top. Now, that, of course, created quite a ruckus of, uh, you know, is there a systemic inequality that was going on here? And um, so the follow-up studies that happened, and I, and I believe that they were genuine, looked at it and found out that it, within the policies and within the practices and all of those things, there did not seem to be evidence of systemic... They would be offered something, and they, the men were more likely to come back with a counter offer. So years ago, like, we'll give you $20,000 a year, and he's like, nah, how about 25? And there would be this negotiation. Now, when you're going from 20 to 25, you're looking at a 25% difference of starting income. What they found was the women who were going into these positions, imagine this years and years ago, they were feeling like they're breaking through the glass ceiling. I'm finally getting, you know, we're finally getting these, these high-end jobs, working as a professor in a college and whatnot, you know, finally getting validated. And when they were offered that $20,000, they were very likely or more likely than men to take it. So that 25% difference between the men who were hired at $25,000 and the women who are hired at $20,000, imagine how that changes those 
uh, salaries over 25 years of incremental percentage of income changes. So if everybody gets a 5% raise, the women got a smaller raise because they started at a different place. And that just built up over time. Example is systemic, how that was built into there. But the expectations for the women coming in, I'm going to take the job, and there's a men were coming in and saying, no, give me more and negotiating, and it made all the difference. So here we are talking about... factors that come into play that interfere with this, you know, early upbringing about how do you negotiate and all those things. And we want to make sure that we can address those things, provide everybody with the opportunity for developing those particular skills. And that would be ultimately more fair. So people would be approaching the same situation from that, from that particular perspective. Okay, so let's get into the, you know, relatively briefer content here. And um, we go into the notion, definition here of social stratification, which is the differences that exist among our society. And in, in sociology, because we're, we talk a lot about the economy and whatnot, we can, we, there's all kinds of ways in which we're different from one another. And certainly we want to recognize all those, but we often talk about difference in socioeconomic status. So we have different models to describe the various differences in socioeconomic status among people in the United States. We have a uh, different systems of stratifications around the world. So there's a caste system, a class system, and a mar might even formulate judgments that somebody who is doing well must have worked hard for it, and those who aren't doing well mustn't be working hard enough. And that's a fallacy because of the systemic things that are involved in there. And so it's important for us to recognize that both of these things are at play. It's not one or the other. You will hear the rhetoric, and if you're going to make social policy about this, you kind of almost have to go on one or the other. So the debates about the economy right now, we're, we're currently um, in the process right at this moment. We're waiting to hear about the federal government's uh, decision regarding stimulus money that's going out into the economy. Now, the government, depending on which side of the aisle you happen to be on in terms of left and right, has always played a role in economic stimulation and trying to manage the economy so the stimulus checks that come to individuals, that there is an expressed fear that if we give money to people, that they will become lazy. You know, if you're getting everything for free, why work? Now, my lived experience of that is that there is a population of people that exist out there that if you paid all their bills, they wouldn't go to work. 
I also know as a person who's worked in the Medicaid system, I've worked in the welfare system, worked with all kinds of people with disability, at least in my personal experience here in Maine, just a very sliver of reality, that most of the people that I knew that were living on the state hated it, hated it. They had a high work ethic and for whatever reason, they couldn't work because of disability or the circumstances that they were in. And they really, really, one of the most uh, prevalent causes of The top 1%, the fact that they hold 30% of the wealth, old money versus new money, what is the middle class, people make $150,000 a year, call themselves middle class, does that seem like the middle to you? You know, the um, people who make 30000 a year call themselves middle class. What is the middle? It kind of depends where you're looking. What's the lower class? Is the working class? You have unskilled, low-paying jobs. They're the underclass people who are not earning as much as they could. They're not employed, the welfare and persons with disabilities, all of these things. Now, when you have a ladder, what we want, whether you're looking at social justice, can take you out, you can close your business, and you were, you were doing great until the pandemic, and certainly we're seeing that tragedy across this country. But we're also, we also have to look at those ladders and see, is the way of climbing up that ladder clearly delineated, and is it fair? Does everybody who wants to climb up that ladder have the ability, or are there some ladders hidden behind the door, and you can't get through the door because the bouncer's keeping you away? You know, sort of like, hey, I want to climb that ladder, and they say, no, because of your last name, because of the color of your skin, even though it might not be that direct, but certainly there's barriers, systemic barriers that keep you from even getting on the ladder. to get into school with some social services help. And we see that specter or that presence, let's say, of social programs that exist to help people move up the ladder. This, the community college system itself across the nation was, was a anti-poverty program, was a program of let's, let's bring trades and two-year programs and you know relatively quick get this person from pre-college to after college and into a good paying job um, for really little money.
subsidizing for the life of that loan. If you have a subsidized loan, the interest rate is being paid off at a, you know, you're paying only 2%. The bank is still getting 10%. The government's paying the 8%. So that is a welfare program. Financial aid is a welfare program. KVCC itself as a state run institution can provide its inexpensive tuition rate cheaper to go to KVCC than it is to any even our even our our brethren really uh, brethren colleges at the university The college is able to keep its um, keep its um, expenses down. I, I teach more classes than my competitor, my, my competitors, my colleagues at, at the University of Maine system, who might teach just two classes a semester because they have to be doing research. I teach five to seven classes a semester. People at Colby College or Bowdoin or Bates, some of the professors there don't teach at all or teach one, maybe two classes a year. And so those discrepancies successfully and we're debating with this idea well we have a history in some industries that when things have been given for free the individual who receives them values them less now I'm not sure if I agree with that or whether that's you know across certainly I don't think it's across the board I've had individuals in my own classes who I know or they've shared with me that their parents are paying every bill that they have and they take it extremely seriously Okay, so what we're starting off with is we have different systems of classifications of inequality. We have caste systems, which are very rare in this world. Class systems, different people and the definition of their uh, socioeconomic status. status. And meritocracy, like we want, as a society, we like to think that we live in a meritocracy and that classes we can actually move we have social mobility to move into different classes the upper class lower class and whatnot based on our efforts now certainly we have that we have individuals we have ladders that people can climb up and and people that can do that by their sheer effort of will and if and their fortune you know if they have the talent and the skills and the intelligence and you know whatever to do those kinds of things they, we do have a meritocracy, and, but at the same time, we do have this, this notion that are, there are, uh, is still a class system and that those, class, those classes, particularly the upper class, are closed off to some degree to new membership. It's, it's harder to get into those areas. Even when individuals find themselves, let's say you're looking at socioeconomic class, you might have this notion of a person has developed themselves to a particular point that they can now join the social club, you know, the exclusive social club. But then as, as it says a little bit later in the chapter here, there's a difference between old money and newly acquired money that might create even additional social barriers between those people. So... These, they all coexist. It's not that they're one, it's all one or the other. We have a class system where there are challenges to moving into different classes that are systemic, not just merit. And we have a meritocracy that we do reward 
good behavior and um, well appropriate behavior towards success and um, but there's always fortune fortune always comes along and we have those uh, you know poor fortune bad luck and and also good luck coming in and changing some of these dynamics so some of the terms that we look at for defining uh, the picture of uh, inequality here in the United States. We have here the standards of living. We have terms like the upper class or the top 1%, the fact that they own 30% of all the wealth. Old money versus new money, like I, was, like I was saying. What's the middle class? We have some people making 150,000 a year who call themselves middle class. And we have some people who are making $30,000 a year and calling them middle class. What's the lower class? What is you know? What does it mean? You're just or the working class. You work by the hour versus by the salary. Different ways that we kind of configure that. Uh, a lot of working class because it's not necessarily a skill based. It's a uh, labor intensive type job. It's mostly unskilled, lower paid. There's the underclass, which are individuals who this is the people who are currently unemployed people on welfare and the trappings of welfare that make it difficult to leave welfare and of course individuals with disabilities and so we look at these terms to kind of like look at different individuals as ways in which we can categorize them and identify the barriers that they have for particular growth let's say let's say we were looking at the uh, the lower part of our society or thinking about disabilities well, we've made inroads in policies related to that with the you know, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act of 1972, and of course, um, accommodations and whatnot that we do to help individuals with, with disabilities still achieve their goals. Individuals on welfare, there are incentive programs to get off welfare, but it can be sometimes really challenging for an individual, particularly if they don't have the educational background and they have existing children, for example, that any their first ventures into the job market, which may be low skilled, underpaid positions, um, would not be enough for daycare or they don't carry insurance. So they would go to work but lose the insurance that is paying for important uh, health care needs that their children have. These are, these are very real barriers that exist for individuals who find themselves in a position and it, it's labor intensive to actually find ways out of that. And like I said before, the, um, the, the vast majority of people that I worked with wanted to get off the system. They, they felt that this was a, a hand up not a handout, most of them, and that they wanted to work toward those things, but that those challenge, challenges were very real. And they're very individualistic. There was, there was no sweeping policy that would take care of all of it, for sure. And there's the simply unemployed. Uh, either their skill set is not in demand, or as we're facing right now in this pandemic, lots of businesses are closed. And so it's interesting and very informative to recognize that uh, this has primarily affected the working class. It has certainly affected everybody, I get that. But the owners of the means of production, um, hopefully, have been, are, are better insulated about this. It hasn't uh, uh, detrimented the, the upper class, certainly. And it's really those individuals that were going from check to check. Now I'm saying some sweeping statements there. So if I if I've stomped on any feet there, uh, that was unintentional. Now the, the next thing we look at is social mobility. How do we move about in these terms? How do we get from where we are to another place? Now that remember a ladder, if we want to signify this as a ladder, a ladder goes both up and down. So we can be somewhere on that ladder and we can go down. That's social mobility too. There's a something happens, you know, you have the fortune or the misfortune thing, or, or we might go up because of fortune, or we, the talents that we have become newly marketable, and, or, you know, something like that, or we have, you know, something emerges, we can go up, and, or we can just through brunt effort, or serendipitous meetings with somebody who, someone who you're talking at an airport bar or with someone, and they're like, man, I need you in my team, you know, and you get this great job offer because you just happened to be flying to Toledo that day. Um, so when we look at social mobility, we want to um, 
look at are the factors associated with social mobility that relate back to fortune, merit, and systemic. And this video, the poor at 20, poor at life, is both a exploration of the systemic and the merit pieces. And I want to combine them both for the sake of this video, because certainly there are systemic reasons why people stay poor and the rich get poor, uh, rich get richer, which is, that's a statistical fact. Those systemic things, but there's also what gets, uh, if you're in a family and uh, for a couple generations now, um, the has been the family in, in, in terms of socioeconomic status has been low performing or underclass, lots of unemployment, lots of issues like that. Who is your role model to break out of that? Who, who do you turn to for advice for making your way out of that system? What have you learned as the norm within that family? You know, those factors play in while at the same time we have systemic factors that even if somebody has the wherewithal to do that. The reason why we note individuals of rags to riches and we celebrate those things is because they're rare. Get that. You know, if this was happening all the time, if people could always do, you know, rags to riches kind of thing, then it wouldn't be news. It'd be like, oh, there's Joe, he did it too, just like his brother Sam. The reason why rags to riches stories are so compelling in our society is not only because they exemplify hard work, fortune, and, and just persistence and all the things that we value, but they also don't happen a lot. So we celebrate them and there's sort of a confounding value in, in celebrating those things because certainly we wanna we want celebrate those things and most of the time, we would recognize that that individuals, we would celebrate the individuals who through merit, um, through hard work and the choices that they made, made their way up and we highly value that and we celebrate those individuals choices, but it, at the same time as we're celebrating that and we should celebrate that, we are, we are also cementing the idea that the way out is simply making better decisions and it's ignoring that's true, but it's ignoring the systemic pieces that are keeping people um, impoverished in where they are. And, and we as people with 2020 lenses now, we want to be able to make sure that we, we don't push one message while ignoring the other. So it's important to keep that in mind. So poverty in the United States, we have different kinds of poverty and poverty, of course, is very important. First off, how do we define what's poor? And that is one of the uh, key aspects of our census process. The census and the, and the IRS uh, determine every year the poverty line and that and it varies by region but there are national poverty lines, there are state poverty lines, and the eligibility for various services depend on those particular, uh, how your wealth and income look like compared to those poverty lines. Let's just say for example, here in Maine, we have things like food stamps, Maine care, Cub care, uh, you know, different uh, SSI and, and different welfare programs and whatnot. And each one of those has policies related to how poor do you need to be before you qualify for those services. And the general, the general uh, policy within, let's say, main care or Medicaid is that your income needs to be 50% below the poverty line. So here's what they consider. Let's say a thousand dollars is considered poverty. You have to be at 500. You have to be 50% poorer than the poverty line to get that full benefit. And so a lot of a lot of state benefits and national federal benefits and whatnot operate on eligibility requirements that hover around that particular statistic. So the the Census Bureau's patterns of data collection how they, what, who do they count as a citizen or not, it affects that. It affects these day-to-day -day administrative pieces of, um, of, of programs related to de determining that poverty line. Now, poverty itself, 
uh, has different character. There's different kinds of poverty that we experience. And so I have in here, there's, there's subjective poverty when I feel I don't have enough to meet my needs. Then there's relative poverty. Other people who are like me are making more money than I am, and I'm jealous of that, and I feel the pain. And then there's absolute poverty where, in truth, you cannot afford the basics of life. So clean water, shelter, health care, you know, one another. There's things you cannot get because of your particular economic status. And these are distinguished from each other. They're all equally painful, but individuals who are experiencing absolute poverty may be a little disgruntled at anybody who's calling themselves poor from a relative poverty perspective. If I look at my neighbors and they have a pool and I can't afford one and I'm frustrated at that, that sense of relative poverty is a very different emotional experience than an individual who can't get enough food on the table. So there's qualitative differences between these experiences of poverty. We go into issues about, you know, the how do we get this data, the U.S. Census poverty. There's a link right there in the book. Um, there's a link to how COVID has impacted poverty in America and what's that doing. So some initial data on that. Looking at food security, certainly an issue that's going on right now and trying to address the, the idea of distributing our food better. And then um, the impact of growing up poor. And finally, we get into the war on poverty, which is the um, dates back from the Lyndon B. Johnson era, where uh, following uh, kind of on the coattails of uh, World War II, we have a, uh, the war term is used to battle poverty and all kinds of social programs came out of that era that we still enjoy today. And so um, what I then go into the stuff that happened during that time, we have community action programs, heating assistance, volunteer lawyers, Job Corps, VISTA, food stamps, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Social Security Act, fin federal financial aid. To add to this the highway system, the community college system, the higher ed system, you know, the University of Maine, the land grant universities all over the places where, the, the, where the, the federal government bought land and then gave it for the development of the university. And the University of Maine is one of those land grant uh, universities. And um, what these were, they were efforts to uh, provide immediate assistance in something like, you know, food stamps and, and heating assistance, and then longer term assistance in terms of financial aid, access to colleges, um, job corps, training programs, those kinds of things. And finally, I ended up with sort of like a, a, a review of one of my favorite characters, the Sergeant Shriver, who was um, married into the Kennedy family and was part of John F. Kennedy's inner circle. And um, he himself was very involved in the development of social programs in the United States. And he has quite a, uh, quite a history of that, both under the Kennedy administration and then, of course, Johnson became president upon the assassination of John F. Kennedy. But Sergeant Shriver was a uh, principal leader of the Peace Corps, Vista Head Start, TRIO programs, and his, him and his wife started the Special Olympics. I mean, he's a pretty amazing individual. I mean, it goes on and on. If you look him up, he was involved in a lot of these programs, all as a part of the overall effort in the United States on the war of poverty. Now, the success of this program has been debated. Certainly, there's case studies of individuals who themselves benefited greatly from these programs. We have TRIO programs here at KVCC going on right now, and some people feel very, very attached to those programs as being very important in their particular success. Overall, there's mixed results from some of these. Admittedly, some of them have not reduced our uh, poverty. Others have had profound effects on our poverty levels and whatnot, which tells us not that these programs aren't working, but because that tell us that these programs are not necessarily the whole solution. If we have systemic problems, then getting food stamps and, heat, and heating assistance is not going to help that. If we have systemic problems in terms of gender 
and getting into particular jobs, then getting school for less expensive is not going to fix that. So we have to realize that if we continue to have these problems of, of equity, that we continue to have existing problems that we haven't identified with, including motivation, hard work, merit, you know, those kinds of things. We, we have to balance those, I think. You know, my opinion is there needs to be a balance between the hand out and the hand up. The handouts are really important, particularly right now. We're looking at a time when people are really having trouble making ends meet, and maybe a handout's what they need right now, and they will return to work. And then there's longer-term solutions. Of how do we prepare, so let's say, the next generation to be uh, more active participants in the economy and, and whatnot? Now, there's only one discussion here, and that is to kind of look at your own social mobility and consider it in light of what we've been talking here. What, what, uh, and I would probably suggest you kind of think about the fortune, merit, and um, systemic things that you may have encountered or you've perceived in your own life um, as ways in which you've come to where you are or barriers that you've, exist, that you've had in life. Or, and they don't have to be really, I had, I had one student in my class where we had the discussion in class that she, her graduation present, was 150 acres of land. They had huge parcels of land and that was her graduation present. And it's not millions and millions of dollars, but that she was able to leverage the use of that land that she got her degrees, she got a house, she, you know, she's way ahead of people who didn't get 150 acres of land. So she expressed a great deal of gratitude toward that gesture that this was a priceless giving to her. It gave her a place to live. She was married to a person who could build houses. They took the wood right off the land. They were able to borrow for the other stuff, just leveraging on the land because there was no money owed on it. I mean, this is an incredible hand up from that family to pass that on and um, fortunate. And, and I, she expressed that, was very fortunate. Couple that with hard work, they built their own house. They saved money. They didn't spend money foolishly. They didn't take loans out for toys or anything like that, even though they could have had anything they wanted. And they placed themselves in a really good position. And um, also, I'm having you look at that Poor at 20, Poor for Life video and comment on that and uh, see what you get out of that. Okay, we venture into chapter 10 and we start looking at things from a more global perspective and things get a little bit more creepy. So I first introduce you to the genie effect, or the gene, I'm sorry, the genie um, correlation or coefficient. And it's a, um, it's a measure of the distribution of wealth in a particular country. And actually, I did a video on that. And that video is right there. You can watch me talk about the genie coefficient, my cycle babble video. So we have, in a global perspective, when we look at inequality, um, I'll jump ahead here to, let, to the World Bank and its idea of uh, inequality looks at countries in kind of the same way we look at people. When we're talking about inequality in the United States, we're looking at, you know, what social class and whatnot. So there's high earners, middle earners, and low earners, you know, kind of thing. And the World Bank will perceive countries like that. What are high-income countries, low-income countries, middle-income countries, or high-development, low-development, medium-development, those kinds of uh, areas that make a country worthy of investment? You know, are they going to give them a loan? And I think what I would like to do is sort of leave this particular chapter as it is and sort of reflect a little bit about some of the concerns that are going on here in, in the rhetoric that's happening. Uh, there's oftentimes a concern about quote unquote money from the United States going to other countries when we have problems of our own. Now, if you have any understanding of the social services processes that are going on in the United States, they far exceed any amount of money that we're sending any other place. But I do, want to, I do want to talk about that idea that money is being sent other places. 
Now, for one thing, yes, there are agreements where money from the United States will go to another country. Mind you, these do not lack strings. There's lots of strings attached to these agreements. Um, and the fact remains that most of the time, when you're looking at a place that might be developed, let's say you have a country doesn't have a lot of infrastructure, doesn't have a lot of roads, doesn't have a lot of, you know, colleges, you know, the kind of economic things that make a country more modern and allow to the creation of those ladders for the population to engage. So if you don't have roads, you don't have any of that, you know, you don't have communication, you don't have any of those things. So this is often seen as an investment that loans go out to foreign countries with a payment plan. Now that they'll pay it when they start getting tax revenue as they tax the growing economy. Now that takes a while. You can't just throw money someplace and instantly people are paying more taxes. The infrastructure needs to be developed and then over time that country becomes, this is the idea, that country becomes more and more able to pay its loan back. If there's trouble in that country, the bank gets worried. Just like if you're going through a divorce or you've lost your job, the bank is going to be calling you and saying, can you still make your mortgage? The same is with countries who have borrowed money. So if there's unrest, if there's civil unrest, if there's a coup, if there's, you know, anything that's going on there, you know, natural disaster, it's of our interest to go in and help people repair that because it will make those individuals, that economy, more robust so they pay off their loan if we're the bank. And the United States is a primary, you know, um, you know, a lot of the World Bank is actually United States banks. So this is investments that banks are making in foreign projects in order to, and they get interest on that and they enrich themselves that way. So this money that's going out there has strings attached. It went, we, we will go out and help people. That's kind of what the country's always done. But the string that's there is we then open up markets for American companies and companies from all over the world. So if we can go in and we can give money to a country to develop infrastructure so that they have roads, schools, power, you know, they have the you know, public safety. They have the, it becomes an economy into which we can move a McDonald's. We can go put McDonald's over there. We can go put a Walmart over there. We can go put a college or a university over there. We can go put a smoke shop over there. Really, it, the idea of this is that when those, uh, that infrastructure is built up, that these will be opening markets to, uh, with national interests. So it's, it remains important in a global economy, really exemplified in this particular chapter, that the United States play a role in helping countries build up that infrastructure because it's going to be multinationals and American companies that are going to go in there and start making money. Now, the, the other thing that's going on there is that when we, when we do uh, the... the infrastructure build. You're looking at long-term investments because, you, know, you know, we got to build the roads and all that. So that takes a really long time and then everybody has to start getting cars. So we have to, you know, doing that learning. People have to get drivers out. And then think about how much has to happen before money starts flowing out of these things. Be mindful that if a country doesn't, let's say, and I'm being very simplistic about this example, but kind of expand it. If a country doesn't have roads, you know what that means? That means they don't have gas stations, and that means they don't have any road construction companies. They don't have tractors. They don't, it's a non-road place, okay? So where, what construction company? Do we just give them the money and they hire a construction company to go in? No, we give them money and they hire our construction company to go in there, or a multinational, or maybe some deal was made on the golf course, but somebody has to go out there and actually build the infrastructure, not if a company is going to go and build roads, not only they have to bring their gas supplies, they have to bring their mechanics, they have to bring the ability to build and repair vehicles, they have to bring that all there. And those are largely 
Western countries that are able to provide that immediate infrastructure so that that building process can begin. Very different than construction projects, let's say, that are going on in the United States where there's an infrastructure already. Unless you're building into a new area of a city, you rarely, you know, businesses that want to start in a particular area don't have to build the road to go out into their business. That's what happens in some of these other countries or when things get destroyed in war and stuff like that, that investing in these other countries turns back into U.S. dollars. So if you think about the kind of money that goes out to another country and how that's spent, first they have to pay it back, and secondly, when they're paying the contractors there, they're sometimes paying American contractors that are there, and that money, so we're lending them money to pay us, and then they have to pay us the loan back. Sounds like a good investment to me. And then if, we can, if, those, if those economies become modern, they become active participants, they become buyers and sellers of products and they enrich all of us with their unique cultural traditions and how they've enmeshed Western traditions in those. So I'm being very Pollyannish about this. I understand there's all kinds of issues and trouble with that and implementation is the problem. Devil in the details, as they say, but Truthfully, that's kind of how the money going out uh, does seem like a good idea uh, when we send money to foreign countries to help them. Not all of it, certainly, and there's certainly some issues and problems and secret motivations and whatnot. I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories or anything like that, but there's certainly a lot of benefit. When we help our neighbors, our neighboring countries to develop, we are often the beneficiaries right along with them. Now, as we get into the end of this week's material here, we have a quiz on global ethics. I'm mean, sorry, we have a discussion on global ethics and then a quiz uh, looking into those Gini coefficients. So the global ethics, I want you to discuss stuff from this chapter, the modernization and dependency theories. This is kind of what I was talking about in terms of investing in other places. The problem that can sometimes happen is we don't let them develop enough because we may build a factory out there. Now, this, this is not we, the United States. This is a company, a multinational company. The United States doesn't make companies go to Mexico. Those companies independently decide to go to Mexico because, or some other country, because labor rates are lower than if they had a company in the United States. So they go over there. Now, labor rates will remain low as long as the general socioeconomic status of that region does not develop. If it starts to develop, then they're going to have to match the raising demand for labor and labor costs will go up and their motivation to go there for lower labor costs is a moot issue. So there is a problem related to investing in foreign countries, but then not allowing for more, you know, not supporting other development that would actually impact the very motivation for them going there. So let's look clearly at these things and how they actually occur and think about the ethics involved in your investment in foreign countries for moder uh, modernization, but maybe we're taking advantage of them. And then finally in the quiz, do you look up two different countries, compare them to the United States and speculate based, maybe look up those countries or whatever. Why does that country have less equality? Why does it have more equality? You know, you look at Denmark and some of those areas, lots more equity there when we look at other parts of the country and in the Middle East and whatnot. Not a whole lot of equity. And so um, in terms of the, so you have to read up, watch the video, read up on the Gini coefficient and what it means, and then um, take this quiz, doing some comparisons with the Gini coefficient with the United States, which has a relatively high degree of inequality. Okay, so that's it for this week. Kind of a long video, and, uh, but you know, I told you I was gonna try and go short. So have a great week, and I'll see you on the discussion boards.